like to present uh, the first paper for this evening. Um, Ms. Deborah Ancor and Ms. Marian uh, Haffenden are presenting a paper entitled Learnings from COVID-19, Investigating Collaborative Online Learning Through the Lens of Staff Development. And just by way of uh, background, um, Deborah Ancor is the Director of Research and Scholarship at the College of Law in Australia, and Marianne Haffenden, uh, her uh, colleague, is the Project Executive uh, for the College of Law of the uh, new Program Master of uh, Legal uh, Business. So over to that video. Um, I'm just checking, are we having uh, technical difficulties? Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about one of our proposed research projects. My name's Deborah Anker and I'm from the College of Law in Australia. The College of Law is a not-for-profit organisation that was established more than 40 years ago, so we've been teaching professional practice for lawyers in Australia and more recently in New Zealand for more than 40 years. We're geographically spread with six offices across those two countries, catering for more than 400 staff and a significant number of students. We manage more than 5,000 graduate diploma of legal practice students in any year across the country. Uh, that's the pre-admission course for law graduates. And we also have specialist applied master's degrees and a Master of Legal Business. They're all taught by coursework, but all of our teaching is predominantly online. Unlike many of our university colleagues who have had to put their courses online quite quickly during COVID, because ours were there already, uh, for us it's been relatively business as usual. The other major difference is that we have not just taken a traditional course and moved it into an online environment, majority of our online courses are in fact designed specifically for that environment. In regulatory terms, we're a self-accrediting higher education institution, which means that we're in the same regulatory framework as the Australian universities. So with our courses already being online, predominantly, when the COVID crisis hit, for us, to some extent, it was business as usual, but there were other effects. So when we were told there would be restrictions, all the college offices closed within a week. And the closure has been planned to last for six months. We're now three months in, and uh, we're still in that space where we think it will be another nearly three months before we transition back into the office spaces. We did have some face-to-face -face teaching that was still part and parcel of our courses. Um, a lot of that was in the skills area and all of that was shifted to online within one to two weeks of moving out of our offices. We had to find, as everybody else did, new ways of communicating both between our staff and between our staff and students. And Zoom and Microsoft Teams were the two platforms that I think have been used most within the college. Other than that, as I said before, it was you know, fairly business as usual. What we have found though, is that the disruption from COVID has given us the opportunity to think differently about 
a lot of things, including our teaching. So one of the things that we are doing currently is trialling whether or not Microsoft Teams might be valuable to use for teaching purposes in a collaborative teaching sense. Uh, we have a program trialling that presently. And we're also seeing a renewed openness to change in many of our staff, a desire to be able to seize the moment and look at what we do in a more innovative way. And that's a very refreshing observation for us to make. I've been watching very closely all of the information, the media, the RSS streams and so on from universities around the world, particularly in Australia, about the issues that they're having with COVID, with their budgets, with their teaching, the problems and the resources that they're finding to assist with those problems. And all of that is an educative process for us in thinking about how we might do things differently and how we might use this disruption to our best advantage moving forward. Any sort of disruption has negatives, but they also have positives. So positives for us. Well, the timing was actually quite positive in that um, I was already, as the Director of Research and Scholarship in the college, looking at using Microsoft Teams late last year um, to set up a space for staff development, particularly around scholarship of teaching and learning. And I was reasonably forward in that planning. In fact, it will be introduced next month um, in July 2020. And it's basically a Microsoft team with a number of channels that allow staff to collaborate and communicate. It's very deliberately built from the ground up for a ground up activity. Um, very democratic site with very little that is hierarchical top-down required. So it's a voluntary process for our staff currently and my task is to build it so they will come. As an introductory activity, we've planned a 12-month online course in modern teaching and learning theory and practice. The anticipation amongst our staff for that is much more than I anticipated. Um, it looks as if it's going to be very positively received, for which I'm grateful. Um, and I think we've hit the mark in what our staff are looking for. So we're going to use that and the impetus from the disruption to conduct some research into how our academic staff think about online adult learning from the student and teacher perspective. Now, we're able to do that um, because the course is going to put our staff into the role of students. Many of them have never been in that role in an online environment. Um, our staff generally come from the legal profession directly. Um, many of them have had no previous teaching experience and no exposure to scholarship of teaching and learning, educational theory, philosophy, um, or any of that background in education that we might expect of academics who have come through the classical research traditional model of uh, a PhD and tutoring while they're doing it and then some university training in and around university teaching. That's never been our model and um, we are probably the worst for that. So this gives us an opportunity to start that process for our staff. So the proposed project basically has two questions. The first is how our teachers, and by teachers I mean anyone who has anything to do with teaching and learning in the college. So that's our teachers, our learning designers, our content developers, the full gamut of staff who are involved with student learning. I'm just using it generically. How do they currently perceive their teaching styles in the context of online learning? And does this perception change after exposure to constructivist learning theory and practice? Because the course that we are 
putting together is very much constructivist, taking our staff from where they currently are to where we hope they might be. So the process for this project is this. At the beginning of the course, we're planning to administer the Teaching Perspectives Inventory. And I'll speak about what it is in a minute. During the course, we're going to be placing our teachers into the role of online students. We're going to be demonstrating different teaching styles and approaches by the way the course is structured for them. We're not actually going to be doing exactly what I'm doing with you today, which is presenting PowerPoints and talking heads about those different teaching styles and approaches. That would be the last thing we want to do in that environment. Um, and isn't it interesting that when, for many of us, I suspect, uh, when we're given an opportunity like this, we immediately go to the PowerPoint. Um, we're going to be creating a number of reflective opportunities and in fact, putting this presentation together has been one of those for me. Um, and encouraging significant collaboration between our staff because the staff-to-staff -staff communication and collaboration has been very difficult in the college due to the geographic distancing. At the end of the course, we'll be administering the inventory again. Um, we'll be giving our staff the opportunity to participate in focus groups using the results from the inventory as conversation starters for those groups. And of course, we'll be reviewing and analysing the results. Now, you might be asking, what is the Teaching Perspectives Inventory and why did we choose it? Well, the Teaching Perspectives, in teaching perspectives Inventory comes from Daniel Pratt's work in the late 1990s. Um, he's written a book, Five Perspectives on Teaching, and this is the graphic here is the cover of the second edition, which was published in 2016, 2017. He talks about five different teaching perspectives, not philosophies of teaching, but perspectives on teaching. And those five perspectives are transmission, apprenticeship, developmental, nurturing and social reform. Then you can imagine the sort of teaching styles that might go along with those approaches, those perspectives. And we chose the five teaching perspectives concept. Um, and we had looked at a number of surveys and the instruments that we might use for this was that we thought that those perspectives fit our context in that they could be used very easily in an environment where we were dealing with applied learning in many cases and in the professional environment. The other thing that we really liked about them was the fact that it's not an instrument that is designed for statistical purposes only. It was actually designed to have value as conversation starter and that was one of the critical things that we were looking for in relation to how we wanted to manage this research, we wanted it to be qualitative as well as quantitative. And because this has been used since the late 1990s and is still in use, there is a maturity to it. It's been well validated and well used continually over the past 20 years. By 2005, uh, it had had 100,000 people taking the online survey. And that's only grown since it's still in use today, particularly in health and allied health. And I um, think we actually have quite a lot to learn from that profession when it comes to education. So the last thing, of course, which was not one of our criteria, but was a bonus for it, was that it's online and it's freely available and there's no cost to the institution. And that's always a bonus. So the benefits that we see may, that may be coming to the college as a result of this survey are, first of all, that it will give us a commonality of language around teaching and the scholarship of teaching and learning that will enable our staff to collaborate better simply because of that commonality. 
we really do want to improve collaboration and communication between our distanced teaching staff. Um, like every organisation, there are silos in ours, and we're hoping that some of those silos will start breaking down as a result of this. And we're putting staff from the various offices and the various business units together in this space of talking about teaching and learning. Ideally, we will see some potential improvements in online design and facilitation and student engagement. But if any of these benefits are there at the end of the process, then we'll be very happy indeed. Now, um, if you have further comments or questions, I'll be online. If you have further questions or comments after the conference, please get in touch with us. Our contact details are on the slide. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, uh, for, for that presentation. Um, I have received a, a question um, from one of the participants uh, for you. So the question for you is, a goal of the course is to allow staff to experience life as an online student. But how similar is MS Teams to the online environments that the students will encounter? That's an interesting question. And I'd have to say that at the moment, um, it's not particularly analogous. Um, our current online courses, while they're developed for specifically for online, so they're not lecture tutorial style of, of uh, approach, um, run through our LMS, which is Canvas, um, and they're quite structured. What we're looking to do is to use Teams eventually as a, um, a portal to that, to bring together with what we already have, um, a range of collaborative activities for our students. So while at the moment it's not analogous, um, it probably will be. But one of the things that I think is really critical, um, and in fact, it's interesting because I was reading an article only this morning by Marcia Devlin, um, who was saying that with COVID, the decision makers of the universities are generally people who really don't have the same uh, background as students, as the students that are currently in the universities. And for many of us, um, and I suspect many who are listening now, your own experience at a university was quite different from what our students currently see. And most of our staff, as I said, have actually no experience at all of the online environment as a student. Um, and what the students are seeing and what the students are doing. And while we're not putting the pressures of assessment on them, um, I think e any exposure will start the thinking process about how different it is for students from our own perceptions of what they're doing. Um, it's, it's a really sort of interesting thing that we tend to impose, I think, still, even without realising it, our own views about what learning is and um, the culture around university and education um, on students who perhaps have completely different ones. I don't know if that answers it. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Deborah. I, I think it does. Um, I have a few more questions. Um, so, the next question, um, first of all, notes uh, and thanks uh, you and uh, your co-author for an interesting uh, presentation. Um, but could you please elaborate a bit more on how to improve student engagement through online teaching? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a lot of work obviously um, being done currently uh, in relation to how students are managing with the online environment that's been imposed on everybody because of COVID um, and the issues that they're finding with it. One of the um, 
things that we've always found is that and my, my own experience is that by putting students in situations where they can collaborate, where they have clear tasks that are authentic to do, that they can see the value of the task, um, where we move away from the traditional um, model of lectures, tutorials, assignments, exams, and into a model of authentic formative assessment tasks and perhaps different summative assessment that allows them to show what they've been capable of, um, that that can drive engagement. It doesn't need to be face-to-face -face synchronous. It doesn't need um, to be the same as we've had in the past moving into the online space. In fact, it's probably not the best way to do it, it's in my opinion at least. Um, I just, as an example, before I came to the college, I was at um, one of the other Australian universities teaching in the same sort of environment um, in the graduate diploma area. And we set up a process for our students where they were basically online doing those sort of things. Um, at the end of the course, we looked at the statistics and we had discussion groups for them to work in collaboratively. We had peer support um, around the tasks, discussion groups and so on. And we had 120 odd students in that class. At the end of the semester, when we looked at the stats, there were something like 160,000 hits on those sites, on those pages. Um, and the work that the students were turning in was amazing. So the engagement was obviously there. Great, thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time um, for, for your session. Um, there was another question, but um, we will pass uh, that question uh, on, you. on to you um, and, and the relevant uh, contact uh, as well. So thank you uh, again uh, for a very interesting presentation, Deborah. Thanks.